For the first time in history, a state now appeared that could not feed its citizens from its own lands. For Periclean Athens had become so large and so specialized in economic activity that the farms of Attica could not provide the city dwellers with enough grain. Since the days of Solon, moreover, Athenian farmers had turned more and more toward production of olive oil and wine. So we see two factors here. Massive growth of the city into a size that the farmland around couldn't support. And the farmland around the city being used for olive oil and wine, anyways. Uh, and these were, of course, by necessity, sold abroad. Along with these processed foods, Athens exported a wide variety of manufactured items, the most visible of which, in our archaeological evidence, was its fine red-figured pottery. In return, Athenian merchant shipping and the war fleet required timber, pitch, and other ships' stores, which came largely from Macedonia, and the industrial population of Athens lived off of grain drawn from Thrace, that's Turkey, Libya, and South Russia, as Pericles said, all good things from all over the world flow into us, so that to us it seems just as natural to enjoy in, uh, foreign goods as our own local products. Not all of the other city-states uh, around the Mediterranean had that luxury. Not all of them had 150 or 500 cities clamoring for Athenian olive oil and wine. Although this specialization made Athens the commercial hub of the Aegean, it also placed the state in a dangerous strategic position. In 437, probably, Pericles made an impressive cruise into the Black Sea, where he unseated a tyrant at Sinope, S-I-N-O-P-E, and concluded a treaty with the native ruler of the Bosporan Kingdom in the modern Crimea, which controlled the export of Russian wheat. To safeguard Athenian access to Macedonia, he settled a large colony at Amphipolis the next year. Already in 461 to 456, the city of Athens proper had been connected by the famous Long Walls, nearly four miles in length, to its port at Phalerum and Piraeus, so that it could be sure of getting food, right, get it from the Black Sea or from the Nile, whoever held the countryside but command of the sea remained an absolute necessity for Athenian security, like the, the case later on with uh, both Japan and Britain. Absolute necessity that they own uh, the, the waves. Periclean Athens had about 172,000 citizens in all, plus 28,000 uh, resident foreigners, called a metic, M-E-T-I-C, and 115,000 slaves, so 172,000 uh, citizens and 115,000 slaves. Citizens and slaves are almost one-to-one. -one. Athens undoubtedly had more slaves than any other Greek state. Servile labor was of primary importance in the silver mines of Laurium, where it was ruthlessly worked to a speedy death. Some factories employed slaves by the tens or fifties. The well-to-do were waited upon by personal servants, partly enslaved Greeks, but more often from Thrace, Scythia, and Asia Minor. While the institution of slavery distorted human values in Attica as elsewhere, one must keep in mind the comments like that of the old oligarch and the orator Demosthenes, that slaves at Athens generally acted and appeared like the common citizens. Manumission was occasionally granted for faithful service, and in the next century a famous banking house was run by two freedmen in succession, Passion and Formio, P-A-S-I-O-N, Passion. Now it talks about farming, says farming was almost everywhere carried on by hard hand labor with simple tools and was devoted to providing the individual farmers subsistence. Only in Attica and a few other regions was specialized production for the market common. So it's very rare, most people just subsistence farmed. In the workshops, grouped in quarters according to their products, the major source of power was that of human muscle. It is small wonder that artistic reflection refused to endorse work as a virtue. Right? This, uh, back in this time, as we all know, Athens, or pardon me, uh, Aristotle and Plato both thought of slaves as useful to get the work done. 
That has to be done to keep humans alive and comfortable, while um, nobles like themselves are freed to think about things, right? There was noble action, and then there was low action. And low action was slave, was muscles, using your muscles, actual, actual real labor. Uh, very, very unlike the American view of a work ethic, where hard work will take you a long ways. Uh, Plato and Aristotle saw that hard work takes you away from the realm of the mind and leisure and education and relaxation. Farming techniques were extremely simple and conservative. Some technological improvement was occurring, as in the milling of grain and baking of bread. But the swift changes common in the Western world since the Industrial Revolution were totally absent throughout ancient history. The Piraeus and similar major ports had warehouses, docks, and other harbor works for long-range trade was conducted almost entirely by sea in vessels of less than a hundred tons which ventured out only from March to October. So from November to February, no, no trade, virtually no trade was going on. Roads were primitive. Land transport by men or donkeys was fearfully expensive. Bottom loans, in which a shipper could borrow usually at around 20 to 33 and a third percent a year, were known by the end of the 5th century, as was also banking but the latter consisted of little more than money changing, pawn broking, or the accepting of deposits. To make economic activity even more difficult, Greece was split into a host of fiercely autarchical states, which had very little concept of sound public finance. Apart from fines, tolls, and fees, major expenses of cult and war were usually borne by impositions on the rich called liturgies, and at times by confiscation, or by inflation of the currency. In these respects, the unification of much of the Aegean under Athenian rule eased commercial interchanges, and the Athenian owls were famous as a stable coinage. They had the goddess Athena on one side and an owl on the other. And uh, Athena was the goddess of wisdom, uh, so that's why owls are intelligent, right? During the 5th century, very important changes occurred in the routes along which Greek trade and culture penetrated the Mediterranean world. Within the Aegean, the port of Piraeus became a, fa a focus, largely replacing the more scattered centers of Miletus, Aegina, Corinth, and so on. Ionia, in particular, fell into a slump very early in the century. Attic trade, however, spread from South Russia to Egypt, as is shown in coin hordes, and Greek culture began to have an appreciable influence in Syria. This eastward expansion became even more significant in the next century, but already by the 5th century, the island of Cyprus had swung firmly into the Greek cultural orbit. The old predominance of Corinth in western markets continued, but was now challenged by Athenian expansionism. The helots, who finally evacuated Mount Etom under guarantee of safe exit, were settled by Athens at Naupactus on the Gulf of Corinth, which remained an Athenian base. A new colony was begun under Athenian auspices in 443 at Turai in southern Italy, near the old site of Sybaris. Athenian diplomatic activity was noticeable in Sicily by the 450s. Here the Greek states were wealthy enough to build huge temples, but they warred incessantly among themselves, as did the ones in Greek, Greece proper. Beneath the surface, Greek power in the west was ebbing. Militarily, the states were still able to hold back Carthage, the Etruscans, and the natives. A great rebellion of the inland Sicils in Sicily, which extended over 459 to 440, was completely crushed. Yet, Greek cultural influence at Carthage mar markedly declined in the 5th century, as it did also in central Italy. The latter region had little contact with the great days of classic civilization in the Aegean, but within that dull backwater, Rome was fixing those institutions and qualities, which were to be of tremendous importance thereafter as it began to exploit the stalemate of the other powers in Italy and Sicily. As the Athenians looked out on this world, they might be pardoned an almost smug attitude of self-satisfaction. Internally, they had closed their ranks in the Persian Wars, and, despite minor grumbling from the right wing of conservatives, had advanced far on the path of democracy. Externally, they had been checked in an effort to gain control of the Greek mainland, but their naval empire stood 